Well, hi there. Welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on in the study that we started last week in Paul's second letter to Timothy. Amen. Amen. Um, that, by the way, at, at all of the studies that we do are left up on the Bible Talk website. So if you missed last week, if you missed the introduction and the first part of the study in Timothy, it's there for you to go see. Uh, so we're going to get right into this where we left off, right after Mark asks for God's blessing on our time together in his word. Oh, Lord, your word is wonderful and leads to grace, mercy, and peace. And we just thank you for it. And we thank you for the work of the cross and this Bible study. Just open our minds and our hearts to get from it what needs to be gotten. Amen. 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 All righty. As I said, we, uh, we, we did the first part with an introduction last week, and we ended uh, on the fourth verse of the first chapter. So 2 Timothy 1.5 is where we're going to pick up, remembering that we had ended with Paul talking about, he's saying, I constantly remember you in my prayer night and day, talking to Timothy. And I think I had asked, you know, is there somebody that you remember constantly? Because there should be. And if you don't have anybody in your life that you can pray for constantly, hey, pray for me. <laughs> All right, 2 Timothy 1.5. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I am sure that it is in you as well. The sincere faith within you. He's talking about that faith inside of Timothy. Sincere means to be without deceit or guile or hypocrisy, mm -hmm. right? It means to be real. The Lord is not fooled by a profession of faith that is not coupled with the action of faith. Okay, he searches the heart. And it's obvious that if there is such a thing as a sincere faith, then there must also be something called an insincere faith yes. by contrast. Right? Yes. Think about that. I mean, Think. people. I hear lots of Christians saying that they're walking by faith, they have faith, they're doing things by faith, but there's sincere faith, real faith, and there is insincere faith. It's the scripture that says <clears throat> that um, God says their lips, they honor you're, me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You're, you're quoting Isaiah, Isaiah 29, verse 13, which, by the way, Jesus quoted that. All right, in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 15, 8, 9, he, Jesus said, You hypocrites. Now he's speaking to the Pharisees, the scribes, and the spiritually blind who were being led by them. Okay, but this is the quote unquote, the people of God. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. This people draws near to me with their mouths and honors me with their lips but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Mm. So it's there on the map, but it's not, it's not in the heart. God searches the heart. Remember that, okay? So what is real? What is sincere faith? Let's just take a look at this, all right? Now, faith, God, I've said this a million times. If you want to know something, God's going to give you the answer. He's given us, as Peter says, everything pertaining to life and godliness. So let's go to him for the answer. And the answer is found in Hebrews 11.1. 1. You probably know this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's what faith is. What does faith result in? Now think about this a minute, because I'll tell you, if you go to most, if you go to many, many large churches, if you watch many preachers on television, you will think that the result of faith is supposed to be stuff, yeah. things, money. Wouldn't you think that? Faith is about getting those things. But let me go back to Hebrews 11 in the second verse, because there it says, for by it, by faith, the men of old gained approval. The goal, the result of faith should be that we enjoy the approval of God. 
not the not the things, but the approval of God. Where does faith come from? Well, you probably know this. I mean, these are all common verses, but the, the question is, do we just hear the words or does it become the, the what our life is driven by? Part of our being. Our being. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from God's word, from hearing, hearing God's, God's word, voice. hearing God's voice, right? Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus said, take care of what you listen to. Be careful about what you listen to. Mark 4, 24. And that's particularly true in these days when we are warned, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 John 4, 1. The result of faith is supposed to be the approval of God because it comes from hearing what he says and obeying what he says. Where does faith dwell? I mean, where is it? Is it in the Bible? I mean, is it where, where is faith? Well, it says with the heart, man believes. Back in Romans 10, 10, right? That's where faith is. It's, it's in your, here in your heart. Now, that's going to become important because it's not in your mind. It's not about what you think. There is a gigantic difference between positive thinking and faith. And unfortunately, too many Christians seem not to understand that, okay? Um, the greatest evidence of positive thinking was Satan. I mean, if you, uh, the enemy. The en if you go to Isaiah in the 14th chapter, and he talks about where Satan says, I will make myself like the most I got. Satan says over and over, five times he says, I will. I will ascend. And I will. I will. I will. And God says, oh, no, you won't. Okay, it's not about what you can think. It's not about, it, it is about what God has said. Okay. How does faith become evident? From the confession of our mouths, remember, in Romans 10, 10, 9, and 10, go read it. It says, we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouths. And the action of our lives. It's about what the belief in our heart, the confession of our mouth, and the action of our lives. Where does the fruit of the Spirit come? Well, it, it'll come. It, okay. It, it comes because, remember, that's the gift. That's what God does in you. Okay? But think about the action of your life. It says in, in Hebrews. Now, Hebrews 11 is considered, you know, the great faith chapter. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very often misunderstood and misused. All right? It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed mm -hmm. by going out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance. By faith, Abraham obeyed. I have so many times, and I've probably shared this here before, going in and teaching like groups of pastors doing pastor seminars, and I'll say, how many of you believe that the blessings of God come by faith? And of course, every hand goes up. And that doesn't, that, listen, it's not true, but it's, it's reasonable. Right. <laughs> okay. Because like this, you see, Faith leads to obedience. Obedience leads to the promises. Mm -hmm. The love of God is unconditional. Hallelujah. He's, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But the promises of God are indeed conditional. Yes, they are. There's always an if. If is probably one of the most common yeah. words in the entire Bible, right? So it's like you have to obey. You have to hear and obey. Because otherwise, God will tell you, here, this is, what you, this is what you're entitled to in faith. This is what I want you to have in faith. But you have to go here to get it. Right. And you say, I don't feel like going there. You're not going to get it. We have to do this. I use this, this may be a, a silly example. It's not a silly example at all. I, but I, I've said this. Ponder this. Think about it. If, if somebody told you right now that down at Burger King, there was a man handing out $100 bills, as many as you could carry, walk away with. I mean, what an incredible blessing. This billionaire just giving away money. You can go down there right now, and you hear the man's giving away right there, $100 bills. So you hop in your car, and you instantly drive down to McDonald's, because you like McDonald's better than Burger King. Guess what? You're gonna, the man's still giving out the money. The money's still there. But you're not there. You're going to miss the blessing. Because you are not, to put it as many of my Pentecostal friends have told me, you ain't under the spout with the blessings coming out. Okay. Faith, even so, faith, James said, if it has no works, is dead 
being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I'll show you my faith by my works. James 2, 17 and 18. There has to be action that lines up with the words that you have believed and treasured in your heart that came from God. No action, no faith. That's true. And that action had better be what God has told you to do. You know, years ago I made up a little poster. Um, I think I did this when we were living in Belize and I had actually the opportunity to do some consulting work for the, for the government. They gave me a little office to use and I put up a poster. And the poster said, in all labor, there is profit. Mere talk leads only to poverty. Well, that's the word of God. Yes, it is. That comes from the book of Proverbs, Solomon's wisdom in Proverbs, right? Proverbs 14, 23. You can talk about it all day long, but if you don't do it, it, it it's not going to profit at all, okay? So in other words, don't just talk about it, do it. Take action. Take action. Now, I, you, gotta, you have to understand, faith can have wobbly knees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can be walking in faith and still having a little shaking in the knees, mm -hmm. okay? Um, because or quiver in your mouth. Because your that's voice. your flesh. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and your flesh is not. Your flesh is not redeemed. This flesh is perishing. This. Look at my flesh. It's decaying. I, even as I sit here, it's my spirit that God is renewing day by day, right. and that will live forever. Okay. So true faith will cause you to act in the face of that wobbly knees. It'll give you the power to act even then. Okay. Think of, there was a man, Jesus went up to, with Peter and John to the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Mm -hmm. And he's coming down, and as he's coming back down the mountain, there's a man there with a son who is demon-possessed, all right? And he came, he, he tried to get the, the disciples couldn't but deal with it, right? And they went to Jesus and asked right. him how come. So the man, yeah, so the man went to Jesus, right, <clears throat> and said to him, you know, can you help, is there any, can you help me? And Jesus said, you're asking me if I can? Mm -hmm. All things are possible to him who believes. Now, remember, he didn't say all things are possible to me. Yeah. He said all things are possible to him who believes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Immediately, it says, the boy's father cried out with tears, it says in the King James, mm -hmm. and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Mark 9, 23 and 24. God knows. You can't, you can't fool him. Right? We're talking about sincere faith. Sincere means without hypocrisy. Okay? Not pretending. Not pretending to be something that it's not. Mm -hmm. So perhaps that wasn't the example of perfect faith, but what of a great example that is of a sincere heart. Yes. Okay? Be sincere. Be honest with God. I, you know, don't obviously. I mean, you can't fool him, all right? If you if you lack the faith or something, how do you get it? Well, where does it come from? From the Word. Hearing. Have a little talk with Jesus. Spend time in the Word of God. If you don't spend time in the Word, you're not going to hear the voice of God. You're, you're not. I mean, you need to be doing that. Okay. Do you have faith? Are you walking in faith? Faith will cause you to do what seems impossible because with God, nothing is impossible, all right? It's, it's about trusting in God, not trusting in your own abilities, not trusting in the world or the things of the world. It's about putting yourself in the hands of God where no man can snatch you out, okay? Because you know that God is in control. But it boils down to having a sincere faith, an honest faith. Being honest, first of all, being honest with yourself, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, I have been to, uh, had the opportunity to visit with, uh, opportunity, I have visited with a lot of large churches, mega churches. And so often I see people coming out of those mega churches and, and they are saying that they have faith to do something because somebody told them that they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. They haven't heard from God. They haven't heard God speak to them. Yeah. You need to hear God speak to you. And bear this in mind. There are a lot of things in the word that God has spoken and that he has not spoken oh, to you.
Now it says, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. So everything in the Word, everything in the Word from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is written for our instruction. It's there for our encouragement. But that doesn't mean that everything is spoken to you. Okay? You need to be able to discern that. One of the great examples for me in, in that is in when Peter starts his letter by saying, you know, he's writing to those who reside as aliens and sojourners, strangers in the land, mm -hmm. right? He's not writing, and he's writing, he says, to those who have a like faith, to those who have the same kind of faith as him. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that same kind of faith as Peter, he's not writing to you. He's not speaking to you. You got to have a Peter kind of faith. What's a Peter kind of faith? Walking on the water, raising up the daughter, rejoicing when you order. That's a Peter kind of faith. You, you, you get it. All right. <clears throat> Paul goes on to speak in that verse of the faith that first dwelt in your grandmother, he's talking of Timothy, to your yes. grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, right? Mm -hmm. So many times when I would randomly ask people that we encountered in the everyday tasks of our life. If I told you that Jesus loves you, would you be the first person, would I be the first person today to tell you that? I mean, mm -hmm. right? We've yeah. just made a habit of that for 40 years. Just I always asking, do you mind if I ask you a question? <laughs> so that, that led to some really exciting results as we traveled the world. I mean, I, we've seen people saved just from that, what's, what came out of that little start, right? But it, it was very interesting to me that as we got into more religious areas, okay, and I'm talking about Christian religion areas, that I would get a different response that, that I was uh, surprising like the first time I heard it, and then I heard it many times. I'd say to somebody, you know, if I told you that Jesus loved you, would I be the first person to tell you that today? And they'd say, well, my mother goes to this church. <laughs> My sister and brother go to this year. Wait a minute. That's not the answer to the question. What's that got to do with you? Yeah. All right? It doesn't matter where your mother goes to yeah. church. Well, they're, they're saying that I don't go to church, so. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's an old song. I, I, I remember it by Woody Guthrie, but it was written before him, I think, in the 20s, 1920s. Mm. Uh, this is, in effect, I mean, this is a hymn. You got to walk that lonely valley, that mm -hmm. lonesome valley. You got to walk it by yourself. Nobody else can walk it for you. You got to walk it by yourself. I would think that the genesis of that song would have been in the Word of God, where it says in the Psalm, Psalm 49 7, no man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. Right. Nobody else can save you. I mean, if Everybody they, else will fail you. But they don't have the power to do job. that. Mm -mm. Jesus does. So it's your relationship with God. is the, Your personal relationship. Your personal relationship with Jesus is the only thing that can bring you to that place of real faith and real salvation. Mm -hmm. Righteousness. It doesn't matter what your mommy did. It doesn't matter what your, did, your daddy did. It doesn't matter. You know, that's what matters. You and your relationship with God. Right? So what Timothy's mother and grandmother, who Paul notes they both had a sincere faith, would have done, would have, in Timothy's life, would have been to train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. They had a sincere faith. They would have been faithful. They would have been raising Timothy this way. They would have been giving him the word. They would have been nourishing him in the word. They would have been encouraging him in the word. That's And that, parents, is what you're supposed to be doing. It's not genetic. No. You know, just because you're a Christian and you have a child doesn't make that child a Christian. They don't pop out Christians. No, and they're still born in sin. I mean, they, right. they come. They're so it's up to you to be sharing the word, training that child in the word of God. Go read that foremost command in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and see where it takes you. When it says that the fathers, you're supposed to teach those commandments to your sons when you're in the house, when you're out of the house, when you're in the way, when you're out of the way, whatever. All the time. All the time. All the time. And that faith that brings obedience to the word, gaining approval, the approval of God, 
would have caused these women to manifest the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Jesus in the everyday life of Timothy. Because that's the call on all of our lives. We are to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. Parents, listen to this. If you train them when they're young, they won't depart from it when they're old. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. Sometimes the middle can be a little shaky. Just bear in mind, have faith in God, right? Have you ever, or should I say, have you never heard the expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink? You know, that expression, as far as I know, goes back at least to the early 1500s. I mean, that's, that's not something new, right? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. But you know what? You can make it thirsty. Give him salt. Yeah, give him salt. Like, well, I mean, isn't that true? Yeah. I mean, I can remember the days before I was saved. You go into a bar and they would have pretzels and yeah. peanuts and all these salty things. Why do you think they did that? Thirsty. Because they loved you? <laughs> no, they loved your money and they wanted to make you thirsty, right? The more so, you ate that, the more you drank. You can't. Let me say it again. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink but you can sure make it thirsty. You can lead your children to the Lord. You can't make them take that, mm. but you should be able to make them thirsty. Yes. Okay. Because why, isn't that not logical? You are indeed, after all, the yeah. salt of the earth. Amen. <laughs> That's what Jesus said, right? You're the salt of the earth. You should be able to make them very, thirsty. very thirsty. And the, and the other thing is, I mean, that's on the Sermon on the Mount in the fifth chapter, but also in the, the fifth chapter, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And I'm going to tell you something. You should be concerned about the satisfaction of your children. Okay? Because we live in a world that is filled with depression. We, with desperation, with a lack of hope, with a failure of hope. Suicide is epidemic in our, in our world. Not just here in the United States, but it certainly is in the United States. And they talk about we have so much to offer. Well, why, why are so many people committing suicide? Because they have no hope. Because they have no hope. They're desperate. Well, would somebody please tell them that there is a hope. There is a hope that is sure, and his name is Jesus Christ. Share God's love. Share his word. Make somebody thirsty for the Lord. And what a glorious opportunity in this dark world where there's such a lack of hope, all right? All right, I'm going to just skip on to the next verse here, all right? Okay. 2 Timothy 1, 6. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you, through the laying on of my hands. Kindle afresh. The King James says, stir up. Mm -hmm. But they're both talking about the same thing. It's like, and the, and the picture here is very definitely a fire. Right. Okay. A fire by its nature will go out. Mm -hmm. Fires burn out, right? Um, it can get rained on and it, it's cool. It can just consume all of the fuel. But or it, it could get covered with it. its ash. Yeah, but it's going to, and then so it loses it's the air. air. Yeah. Right. It mm -hmm. loses air. And you stir it up, you break that ash off, and the embers are exposed to open air and they start glowing. Again. Absolutely. Absolutely. To the breeze, to the wind. Uh, I was trained in the Navy. I, I don't know if you went through this in, in the Navy. I, I was in the old Navy. Not the store. I was in the old Navy. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm talking about before the, when fire was brand new. I <laughs> oh, no, no. Okay. They still had <laughs> sails on their ships. Yeah, yeah wooden oh, ship and Iron Man. Yeah. But I was trained in firefighting <laughs> because when you're out at sea or you're in, like I was, flying, you're in an airplane and you have a fire. You don't call 911 or 999 no, and the fire not. department's not coming. You're it. That's right. So you're trained on how to extinguish a fire. And the way you extinguish a fire is by either removing, you remove the heat, you remove the fuel, or you remove the oxygen, the air. Mm -hmm. Any one of those things will put a fire out, right? So the opposite is true here. If a fire is going out, it's because it's losing one of those things. Right. It's losing the heat, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's losing fuel. the fuel or it's losing the oxygen, the air, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what a fire requires. Mm -hmm. So the fuel, 
Think about it. I just look at all three of these: the fuel, the heat, and the and the uh, air. What's a praise is spiritually. That's that would be a good thing to do. <laughs> praise it spiritually. The fire in you yes. requires the word of God, the thing that we just spoke about, that brings faith alive in your heart, and that fuel must be continually fed to the fire. Okay, the more word that goes into you, the brighter the fire will be. And it's important that you understand that you're, you yourself are also, you're the fuel for the fire, right? Yeah. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, and he said, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves, your bodies, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Romans 12, 1. You're the fuel. You're the fuel, not the fool. <laughs> Sounded like you said fool. Oh, no, you are the Fuel. fuel. Okay. You are the fuel. Paul continued on in his letter there in that church of Rome in the next verse, right? And he, well, not in the next verse, but he said that we are to be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Okay. What is the word fervent that's used there literally means to boil with heat, to burn. Mm -hmm. You gotta have you gotta have a faith that's on fire. Elijah the prophet was a man who was filled with a jealous zeal for God. He was used of God to challenge and turn back the people of God who had become lukewarm back to the Lord on Mount Carmel. Right? Mm -hmm. you, all, you all know this yes, account? Yes. It's in First Kings chapter 18 and 19. If you don't, please take time to read it. He was the man that James said accomplished much by his prayer. He's the example of, you know, the, the, the effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah is the example of that. As Alice and I have traveled through much of the world in ministry, people would often ask me, I mean, this is a common question. What kind of Christian are you? You know, they're looking for my, they're trying to pigeonhole. make pigeonhole you. They're trying to find the denomination. Yeah. So, right. And I, I have an answer for that that is the only answer I have for that. If somebody says to me, what kind of Christian you are? I say, excited. Because mm -hmm. if you're not excited about Jesus Christ, you better go into your prayer closet and find out why. All right? Because I'm going to tell you something. He is exciting. Yes, he is. Right? Remember the words of Jesus in his letter. The first letter to the churches in Revelation. So, you know, in chapter three, two and three of Revel the book of Revelation, Jesus sends letters to each of seven churches. The first one is the church at Ephesus. And Jesus commends them for so many things that they're doing. But then he says, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. I don't know how long you've been saved, but are you excited about Jesus today as the day you got saved? Have you left your first love? Love needs to be encouraged. It needs to be nourished. It needs to be fed. It needs to be cultivated. Alice and I just celebrated our anniversary recently. It was 50 years and nine months. That's right, an anniversary, because we have celebrated our anniversary every month. Mm -hmm. For 50 years and nine months. Mm -hmm. It's worth it. Yes. It's worth it. Yes. Love needs to be nourished. Excitement needs to be nourished. And God expects you to be excited about him. I, I, I really have a lot more to say about this, so I don't have the time to go into it. So I, I want to end there for this session. But I want you to come back. Because we are going to get into this a little more deeply. Because it is worthy of our deep consideration because it is our faith in action that is alive, that is sincere, that is real, that has to come to the forefront and make us a shining light that we are fulfilling what Jesus said, we are the light of the world. We will see you again next week. God bless you and goodbye. Oh uh...